The Valiant Little Tailor, a fairy tale by the Brothers Grimm. One fine day, a tailor was sitting on his bench by the window, in very high spirits, sewing away most diligently, and presently up the street came a country woman, crying, Good jams for sale! Good jams for sale! This cry sounded nice in the tailor's ear, and poking his diminutive head out, no one know, he called, Here, my good woman, just bring your jams in here. The woman mounted up the three steps to the tailor's house with her large basket and began to open all the pots together before him. He looked at them all and held them up to the light, smelt them, and at last said, These gems seem to be very nice. Weigh me out two ounces, my good woman. I don't object to even if you make it a quarter of a pound. The woman, who had hoped to meet with a good customer, gave him all he wished and went off grumbling in a very bad temper. Now, exclaimed the tailor, heaven will send me a blessing on this gem and give me fresh strength and vigor. And then, taking the bread from the cupboard, he cut himself a slice of the size of the whole loaf and spread jam upon it. That will taste very nice, he said. But before I take a bite, I will finish this waistcoat. So he put the bread on the table and stitched away, making larger and larger stitches every time, for joy. Meanwhile, the smell of the jam rose to the ceiling where many flies were sitting, and enticed them down. So soon a great swarm of them had pitched onto the bread. Hola! Who asked you? exclaimed the tailor, driving away the uninvited visitors. But the flies not understanding his words, would not be driven off, and came back in even greater numbers than before. This put the little man in great passion, and, snatching up in his anger a bag of cloth, he brought it down with a merciless swoop upon them. When he raised it again, he counted as many as seven lying dead before him with outstretched legs. "'What a fellow you are!' he said to himself, astonished at his own bravery. The whole town must hear of this. In great haste, he cut himself out a band, hemmed it up, and then put it on with large letters, Seven at one blow! Ah, he said, not one city alone, the whole world shall hear it. And his heart danced with joy, like a puppy dog's tail. The little tailor bound the belt around his body, and made ready to travel forth to the wide world feeling the workshop too small for his great deeds. Before he set out, however, he looked about his house to see if there was anything he could carry with him, but he only found an old cheese which he pocketed. Observing a bird which was caught in the bushes before the door, he captured it and put that in his pocket also. Soon after, he set out boldly on his travels, and, as he was light and active, he felt no fatigue. His road led him up a hill, and when he arrived at the highest point, he found a great giant sitting there, who was gazing about him very composedly. But the little tailor went boldly up and said, Good day, friend. Truly you sit there and see the whole world stretch below you. I am also on my way thither to seek my fortune. Are you willing to go with me? The giant looked with scorn at the little tailor and said, You rascal! You wretched creature! Perhaps so, said the tailor. But there may be seen what sort of man I am. And, unbuttoning his coat, he showed the giant his belt. The giant read, Seven at one blow. And supposing they were men whom the tailor had killed, he felt some respect for him. Still, he meant to, to try him first. So, taking up a pebble, he squeezed it so hard that water dropped out of it. Do as well as that, he said to the other, if you have the strength. If it be nothing harder than that, said the tailor, that's child's play. And, diving into his pocket, he pulled out the cheese and squeezed it till the whey ran out of it, and said, Now, I fancy that I have done better than you. The giant wondered what to say and could not believe it of the little man, 
So, catching up another pebble, he flung it so high that it almost went out of sight, saying, There, you pygmy. Do that if you can. Well done, said the tailor. But your pebble will fall down to the ground again. I will throw one up that will not come down. And, dipping his hand back into his pocket, he took out the bird and threw it into the air. The bird, glad to be free, flew straight up and then far away, and did not come back. How does that little performance please you, friend? asked the tailor. You can throw well, replied the giant. Now truly we see if you are able to carry something uncommon. So saying, he took him to a large oak tree, which lay upon the ground, and said, If you are strong enough, help me carry this tree out of the forest. With pleasure, replied the tailor. You may hold the trunk upon your shoulder, and I will lift the boughs and branches, they are the heaviest, and carry them. The giant took the trunk upon his shoulder, but the tailor sat down on one of the branches, and the giant, who could not look around, was compelled to carry the whole tree and the tailor also. He, being behind, was very cheerful and laughed at the trick, and presently began to sing a song. There rode three tailors out of the gate, as if carrying of trees was a trifle. The giant, who had staggered very short distance with the load, could no go no further and called out, Do you hear? I must drop the tree. The tailor, jumping down quickly, embraced the tree with both arms as if he had been carrying it, and said to the giant, Are you such a big fellow, and yet you cannot carry a tree by yourself? Then they traveled further, and as soon as they came to a cherry tree, and the giant seized the top of the tree where the ripest cherry hung, and bending down, gave it to the tailor and told him to eat. But the tailor was far too weak to hold the tree down, and when the giant let go, the tree flew up in the air, and the tailor was taken with it. He came down on the other side, however, unhurt, and the giant said, What does that mean? Are you not strong enough to hold that twig? My strength does not fail me, said the tailor. Do you imagine that that was a hard task for one who has slain seven at one blow? I sprang over the tree simply because the hunters were shooting down there in the thicket. Jump after me if you can. The giant made an attempt, but could not clear the tree, and stuck fast in the branches, so that in his affair, too, the tailor had the advantage. Then the giant said, since you are a brave fellow, come with me to my house and stop a night with me. The tailor agreed and followed him. And when they came to the cave, there sat by the fire two other giants, each with a roast sheep in his hand, of which he was eating. The tailor sat down thinking, Ah, this is very much more like the world than my workshop. And soon the giant pointed out, a bed where he could lie down and go to sleep. The bed, however, was too large for him, so he crept out of it and lay down in a corner. When midnight came, and the giant fancied the tailor would be sound asleep, he got up, taking a heavy iron bar, and beat the bed right through at one stroke, and believed he had thereby given the tailor his death blow. At dawn, the giants went out into the forest, quite forgetting the tailor, when presently up he came, quite cheerful, and showed himself before them. The giants were frightened, and, dreading he might kill them all, they ran away in a great hurry. The tailor traveled on, as following his nose, and after he had journeyed some long distance, he came to a courtyard of a royal palace, and feeling very tired, he laid himself down upon the ground and went to sleep. Whilst he laid there, people came and viewed him on all sides, and read the belt, Seven at one blow. Ah, they said, what does this great warrior here in this time of peace? This must be some valiant hero. So they went and told the king, knowing that should war break out, here was a valuable and useful man, whom one ought not to part with at any price. The king took advice and sent one of his couriers to the tailor to beg him for his fighting services if he should be awake. 
The messenger stopped at the sleeper's side and waited until he stretched out his limbs and unclosed his eyes, and then mentioned to him in his message. Solely for that reason did I come here, was his answer. I am quite willing to enter the king's service. Then he was taken away with great honor, and a fine house was appointed him to dwell in. The couriers, however, became jealous of the tailor, and wished him on the other end of the world. What will happen? They said, one another. If we go to war with him, he, when he strikes out, seven will fall in one stroke, and nothing will be left for us to do. In their anger they came to the determination to resign, and they all went together to the king and asked for his permission, saying, We are not prepared to keep company with a man who kills seven at one blow. The king was sorry to lose all his devoted servants for the sake of one, and wished he had never seen the tailor, and would gladly now be rid of him. He dared not, however, dismiss him, because he feared the tailor might kill him and all his subjects and the seat himself upon the throne. For a long time he deliberated, till finally he came to a decision, and sending for the tailor, he told him that, seeing he was such a great hero, he wished to beg a favor of him. In a certain forest in my kingdom, said the king, there are two giants who, by murder, rapping, fire, and robbery have committed great damage, and no one approaches them without endangering his own life. If you overcome and slay both of these giants, I will give you my only daughter in marriage, and half the kingdom for a drowry. And hundreds knights shall accompany you, too, in order to render you assistance. Ah, that is something for a man like me, thought the tailor to himself. A lovely princess and half a kingdom are not offered to one every day. Oh, yes, he replied. I will soon settle these two giants, and a hundred horsemen are not needed for that purpose. He who kills seven at one blow has not fear of two. Speaking thus, the tailor set out, followed by the hundred knights to whom he said, Immediately they came to the forest at the edge. They came to the edge of the forest. You must stay here. I prefer to meet these giants alone. Then he ran off into the forest, peering about him on all sides. And after a while he saw the two giants sound asleep under a tree, snoring so loudly that the branches above them shook violently. The tailor, bold as a lion, filled both his pockets with stones and climbed the tree. When he got to the middle... When he got to the middle of it, he crawled along a bough, so that he sat just above the sleepers, and then let fall one of the stones after another upon the body of one. For some time the giant did not move, until, at last awakening, he pushed his companion and said, Why are you hitting me? You've been dreaming, he answered. I did not touch you. So they laid themselves to sleep again. And presently the tailor threw a stone down upon the other. What was that? Why are you knocking me about? I did not touch you. You're dreaming, said the first. So they argued for a few minutes, but both being very weary due to the day's work, they soon went to sleep again. Then the tailor had his fun again, picking out the largest stone, and threw with all his strength upon the jest of the first giant. This is too bad, he exclaimed, and jumping up like a madman, fell upon his companion, who considered himself equally injured, and they set to it in such good earnest that they uprooted all the trees and beat another until they both fell dead upon the ground. Then the tailor jumped down and sang, What a lucky piece they did not pull the tree upon which I sat on, or else I must have jumped on to another like a squirrel, for I'm not used to flying, he said, as he drew his sword, and cut a deep wound into the breast of both. He went to the horseman and said, The deed is done. I have given each the death stroke, but it was a tough job, 
for in their defense they uprooted trees to protect themselves with. Still, all that is of no use, when such as one as I come, who sev slew seven in one stroke. And you are not wounded? they asked. How could you ask me that? They have not injured a hair on my head, replied the little man. The knights could hardly believe him, till, riding into the forest, they found the giants lying dead, and they uprooted trees around them. Then the tailor demanded the promised reward of the king. He repented of his promise, and began to think of a new plan to shake off the hero. Before you receive my daughter, and have the kingdom, he said to him, you must execute another brave deed. In the forest there lives a unicorn, commits great damage. You first must catch him. I fear a unicorn far less than I do two giants. Seven at one blow is my motto, said the tailor. So he carried with him a long rope and an axe and went off to the forest, ordering those who were told to accompany him to wait on the outskirts. He had not to hunt long, for soon the unicorn approached and prepared to rush him as if it would pierce him on the spot. Steady, steady, he exclaimed. That is not done so easily. And waiting until the animals were close upon him, he sprang nimbly behind a tree. The unicorn, rushing with all its force against the tree, stuck its horn so fast in the tree that it could not pull it out again. And so it remained prisoner. Now I've got him, said the tailor. And coming from the, behind the tree, he first bound the rope to its neck, and then cutting the horn out of the tree with his axe, he arranged everything, and leading the unicorn, brought it before the king. The king, however, would not deliver the promised reward, and made a third demand that, before the marriage, the tailor should capture a wild boar that, which did much damage. He should have huntsmen to help him. With pleasure, was the reply. It is mere nothing. The huntsmen, however, he left behind, to their great joy, for this wild boar had already so hunted with them that they saw no fun in it now. As soon as the boar perceived the tailor, it ran at him with gaping mouth and glistening teeth, and tried to throw him down on the ground. But our flying hero sprang into the little chapel which stood near, and out the window again, on the other side in a moment. The boar soon came after him, but he... Skipping around, closed the door behind it, and there the furious beast was caught, for it was much too unwieldy and heavy to jump out the window. The huntsman now, or the tailor now ordered the huntsman up, that they might see his prisoner with their own eyes. But our hero presented himself both before the king, who was obliged at last, whether he would or not, keep his word, and surrendered her da his daughter and half the kingdom. If he had known that it was no warrior, but only a tailor who stood before him, it would have grieved him still more. So the wedding was celebrated with great magnificence, through, though with little rejoicing, and out of a tailor there was made a king. A short time afterwards the young queen had heard her husband talking in his sleep, saying, Boy, make me a coat, and then stitch up these trousers or I will lay the yard measure over your shoulders. And then she understood of what condition her husband was, and complained in the morning to her father, and begged that he would free her from her, from her husband, who was, no, who was nothing more than the tailor. The king comforted her by saying, This night leave your chamber door open, and my servants will stand outside, and when he is asleep they shall come in, bind him, and carry him away to a ship, which shall take him into the wide world. The wife was so pleased at the proposal, but the king's armor-bearer, who had overheard it all, went to the young king and revealed the whole plot. I will soon, I will soon put an end to this affair, the valiant little tailor said. In the evening, at their usual time, they went to bed. When his wife thought he was asleep, she got up, opened the door, and laid herself down again. The tailor, however, only pretended to be asleep, and began to call out in a loud voice, Boy, make me a coat, and then stitch up these trousers, or I'll lay the yard measure about your soldier. Seven have I slain at one blow, and two, two giants have I killed, and a unicorn I have led captive, 
and a wild boar I've caught, and I shall be afraid of those who stand outside my room. When the men heard these words spoken by the tailor, a great fear came over them, and they ran away as if wild huntsmen were following them. Neither afterwards dared any man venture to oppose him. Thus the tailor became a king, and so he lived for the rest of his life. The End <laughs>